Hello, my name is Nina Grojani from the Austrian NGO Aktion Regen. Today I have the pleasure to interview our great and very experienced trainer, Margaret Bachlechner. She is a committed campaigner against FGM, which are the practices of female genital mutilation. To make it easier for you to find your way around the video, I have added subtitles on interleaves. First, a few words about Aktion Regen. We have been active in East and West Africa for over 30 years with educational projects on family planning and sexual and reproductive health and all related issues. We pursue a sustainable strategy. We train local multipliers, so-called RAIN workers, and they pass on this existential knowledge to their people in the regions at a low threshold and culturally sensitive way. To ensure that the knowledge is comprehensible and understandable, we use clear, de-taboo teaching tools. Rain workers work in village communities, as well as in cooperation with schools, health centers, and other organizations and institutions. Our education program, Knowledge as a Chance, aims to protect children, teenagers, and adults from life-threatening and health-threatening practices and traditions such as FGM and teenage pregnancies resulting from early marriages. The wonderful Margaret Bachlechner is my interlocutor today, as she is an expert in this field. Before interviewing her, I want to present her and, and shed some light on Margaret's impressive life and work. Margaret Bachlechner is a very experienced trainer and has been supporting Aktion Regen for more than 15 years. Margaret was born in 1956 in Kenya, Nakuru, in the Rift Valley district. Together with her husband, she has been living in the mountains of East Tyrol for 15 years and has kept her close ties to her homeland. Until the Corona pandemic, she flew to East Africa at least twice a year for a few weeks for trainings, workshops, sensitations, and networking meetings. Since Corona, she has been in intensive online contact with her local colleagues and protégés. A social worker by formation, Margaret was formerly active in the Green Belt movement. This is a Kenyan grassroots movement founded by Wangari Matai for climate protection and for strengthening social communities that even got the Nobel Prize for Peace some years ago. Margaret has also been involved with street girls over the last three decades and has been particularly active in protecting Maasai girls from FGM practices and early marriage for the last 20 years. She is a co-founder of the German Association Tukutane e.V., which pursues these very goals and has already been able to provide many girls with accommodation in year-round schools or vocational schools. From the beginning, Margaret's aim, main focus was on the empowerment of girls and women. Through Aktion Regen, she has found the missing piece of the puzzle for her mission. How will she be able to holistically support societies to develop healthy and sustainable perspectives for the future? Today at the 7th of May, together with many organizations around the world, we are taking a strong stand against FGM being part of the Worldwide Day of Genital Autonomy. In February, the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilations is celebrated annually, which also aims to protect girls from specific physical violence. All of us organizations speak out on this issue many days of the year, and every day there is still sexual violence against children and adults in many countries around the world. This means that every day the lives and health of millions of girls and women around the world are threatened. 
they suffer physical and phys psychological pain that often leads to death. International attention to these life-threatening, painful and humiliating traditional practices of FGM has been around for a long time. The United Nations have set a target of zero FGM by 2030. A total of 200 million girls and women worldwide are currently victims of FGM. The origins of these practices go back thousands of years and are socio-culturally based. The performance of FGM is prohibited by law in almost all countries of the world. A global commitment to end these unfounded acts of violence is in place. So, dear Margaret, thank you so much for your willingness to do this interview. My first question is a very personal and emotional. I am a mother of three girls between the ages of 10 and 15 years. It is an unimaginable thought for me to deliberately inflict such life-threatening and lifelong torture on my daughters. I love my children more than anything in the world and I want only the best for them in every way. What are the motivations and intentions of parents in Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia and others who deliberately expose their girls to these risks? Is this question even permissible or too Eurocentric? My worldview tells me that all parents love their children. What is your answer? Thank you, Nina, for this invitation. You are absolutely right. You cannot look at this issue from European eyes and simply change your way of life. I always tell the same thing when I talk about FGM in Austrian schools. It is much more complicated. We have to be willing to look at FGM, not just as physical mutilation. We have to look at it as a whole picture and look at families and communities as a whole. Only then we will find an approach that allows people to make new healthy choices for their girls. That is what Action Reagan does. FGM is a brutal practice, thousands of years old, passed down from generation to generation. It is mainly about the power position of men. You are also right that mothers in Kenya and other countries also love their children. But women have been 100% dependent on their husbands for the longest time, and they are still, in many cases, in every respect. Men have always decided who they want to marry and what woman should be like, that she has to be circumcised. Men learn this from their forefathers as the only possible way to live. Their culture demands that they continue this tradition. The male mentality has developed over countless generations and also has a lot to do with obedience. What is expected of men by society? To use the value of love here would be a completely wrong approach. For men and women, love also means to follow one's tradition, one's own culture. We have to start differently. We have to point at, at the way they have children, how they can deal with their sexuality, with sexual behavior in general, and how this is influenced. Another personal question. You grew up in a large Maasai area in Western Kenya and told me when we first met that your mother worked in a health profession for women. What and how did she work with or against FGM? My mother had a woman's health profession. She was a midwife. She worked in a hospital that had been set up by an Englishman in the Maasai area to support the community. The British hospital operator and my mother were aware of the FGM situation and wanted to help the women. Already my mother came from a community where FGM was not practiced. This was in the mid 1960s. They both made an arrangement with the village communities that the women and girls must come to the hospital to my mother for circumcision. There, my mother then performed a fake circumcision. Margaret, what do you mean by fake? 
Mm. My mother was a very clever woman. She realized that men didn't know what a circumcised woman looked like. Physical, physical issues and sexuality were a very big taboo back then. They were not talked about. It is still partly like that today. In any case, the men knew that their wives should be circumcised, but not what it was really like. And the women also only had an idea of a scar down there and no exact imagination. To keep up appearances, they circumcise the Libya minora, the inner labia, which is in line with Maasai culture. Of course, knowing about the high organic importance of the clitoris, my mother did not remove it. Instead, she sewed the upper skin of the labia majora over the, over the clitoris. This gave both women and men an externally visible result that corresponded to their cultural conception, a seam or a scar. However, medical complications, health consequences, and pain were relatively limited. Another part of the deal with the community was that the women would also be sent to my mother during pregnancies and childbirth. This way, she could support the women in the best possible way. So you are in the midst of this FGM tradition. Did you know what exactly your mother was doing? As a child, I did not understand what my mother was doing at all. And I was traumatized because all I saw were 12, 13 year old girls bleeding at my mother's house every year around the same time in December when the initiation rites took place. There were already grown men waiting to marry them. My mother just said that they had a disease and that she would help the girls to stop bleeding. I was very afraid of this disease, but my mother did not tell me anything. She was not allowed to tell anyone the truth. Only her assistant at the hospital knew everything. The pressure from the community was enormous. She was taking a big risk with her fake circumcision. Yet, She worked in this way for over 30 years. By 1995, she was an old woman when she stopped and passed on in 1999. So how has this time shaped you? After all, you have spent your entire adult life working for girls and women's empowerment for the prevention of FGM and spreading knowledge on sexual and reproductive health and family planning. Would you call your efforts following in your mother's footsteps or is it all self-driven? The older, the more grown up I became, the more I understood because I listened well to what she was talking about with her assistant. That's how I gradually picked up the truth. My mother only told me everything when she had already retired and stopped working. A midwife in Kenya doesn't just retire in her early 60s. She works as long as she can until she's very old. I think my mother was a hero, but it was only when I started working against FGM myself that I realized I was carrying on her mission forward, but on different terms. While she was committed to fake under the circumstances of the time, I am committed to zero FGM. Thank you very much for this personal insight. Now I'm coming from the very personal view to the political framework. You come from Kenya. FGM has been banned since 2001, and there have been major legal tightenings since 2011. Nevertheless, according to the United Nations Population Fund, the FGM rate among girls and women between 15 and 49 years is 21%. And among those under 15 years, 11%. These are only the official figures. Is the United Nations a naive in its goal of ending FGM by 2030? I recently read The Guardian, a British newspaper, that the Kenyan government even declared 2022, that is next year, as a target for FGM elimination. Does it frustrate you that these targets and the current reality are so far apart? Is the policy doing too little or the wrong things? 
what measures are really working to bring up a change in the population's thinking? Yes, it's true. The first UN development goals wanted to eliminate MGM as early as 2015. Unfortunately, that it didn't work out. 2022, the government, the Kenyan government wants to tighten the FGM laws again. Last October, in the middle of the corona year, large initiation rights were held in Kuria area on the Tanzanian border with 3,000 girls who suffered FGM. However, 10 local chiefs who are official representatives of the authorities were immediately detained and removed from office. This means that something is being done by the government. For Action Reagan, I work very close to Kuria with the Migori Mabera Women's Group. Like Kuria, this is the so-called Bush area. The communities here think the law is only in Nairobi, and Nairobi is far, far away. Especially from the men there, there is still a lot of ignorance. I have experienced myself and also experienced in my mother's time that together with the church, many things can succeed. Since 1980s, church communities have emerged and have also campaigned for girls to be allowed to go to school and for marriages between different tribes to become more and more possible. This has helped in so far as FGM is not so established anymore in other tribes and men could now also suddenly marry and circumcise women. As an Action Reagan trainer with a lot of life experience and a certain age, I am very much recognized and respected in village communities. This is related to the traditional cultural respect for elders. But together with the local church communities, I have even more opportunities to reach out and educate people. Above all, I can get the men on board better. Churches are the places where people go when they have problems or even too little to eat. They are places of trust, respect, and I use this channel. And how do you manage to get the men on board, the fathers as well as the influential elders? It's important to make men understand that their children experience terrible things and that terrible things have also happened to their wives. And in terms of their partnership, that FGM negatively affects their sexual life. We at Action Reagan named the existence of two bridges. The first bridge symbolizes the way back to the old traditions. The second bridge witnesses the way into the new time. Through Knowledge as a Chance, which is the Action Reagan education program, we provide all the necessary knowledge so that people can move forward in the fastest possible way. They are given all the options to be able to take responsibility for their bodies, their sexuality, and the future of their children. Going back to history is not possible. Many understand this through our education. It is also important to emphasize that we do not dictate. We offer knowledge and sometimes use very physical, understandable pictures. In order for the fathers to really understand what is happening to their girls and what has happened to their wives, I specifically appeal to their imagination. For example, I let them imagine that the tip of their penis is cut off and not just a piece of foreskin. It's fantasy. And I recognize from the faces that every father can imagine it for real. We have to make many offers bring in many perspectives because we want to achieve understanding. As an Action Regen representative, you work on several fronts to fight FGM. You're inside the village communities to reach out the families and village elders. And you use the structure of established church communities, which have a large influx of people with difficulties. And you often cooperate with the church, who, which also protects girls from FGM and early marriages. You are directly involved with families and also work with children and young people in schools. So how important are schools as an educational and protective institution for girls affected by FGM? The importance of schools is huge in many ways. 
I will give you an example of a community where Action Reagan conducted education and awareness workshops. In this village, the headmistress of the school came from another more rural tribe that provided education for its girls and where FGM and also early marriages were no longer prevalent. These two issues are always strongly connected. I was able to appeal to the pride of the men in this community through the example of these professionally successful, respected women. I said how great it would be if one of their daughters could be a school headmistress once and not from another tribe. How great would it be if this community itself could produce respectable, recognized, educated women? The girls' educational careers are of course connected to this subject at least until they are 18 years old. And another consequence is that they have to experience adolescence physically protected and above all unmarried. The fathers are more and more willing to understand that this educational time is important. I am motivated them and do not blame them. And for the girls, I was able to gain time. When they will reach the age of adulthood, they decide for themselves based on a lot of important knowledge and make their own professional mm -hmm. life plans. Girls and boys too, who have been educated and enlightened for many years have a different mindset than their parents. They can and will make different decisions. We were only talking about girls till now. The boys are also very important, is that right? The boys are another important group in school. They should be on board from the beginning on, since they will be the future husbands and fathers. Schools nowadays are mixed, not only by gender, but also by origin of the students from different tribes. Suddenly, there are girls who are never circumcised because it is no longer tradition in their tribe, and they are together with kids coming from very traditional FGM practicing tribes. And then this dilemma happens. A boy marries such a girl, but his tradition demands something else. The parents also need the education and perspective that it is okay for their son to marry a girl who is not circumcised, which contradicts their own tradition. Conversely, in relation to their own daughters, fathers need to reflect. If the son is now allowed to marry an uncircumcised woman, then it must also be okay that their own daughters are not circumcised. After such an educational session, three fathers came spontaneously, brought their daughters to school for the first time. That was a great success. Mixing at schools has a terrible effect on a rethinking and learning of today's generation of parents and helps to break the old patterns. We at Action Reagan use the schools in a targeted and cooperative way as a positive level or enforcement. Sometimes it's also necessary to buy the cows out of the FGM danger for the education time to award scholarship which circumcises and pay parents benefit economically. Because in connection with FGM, in education rights, there is very much about material values. It is about gifts and money for the families and the circumcisers. This really also needs to be acknowledged and solutions need to be found. How can compensation work for these previously provided and needed gifts of money and goods, which are an essential part of the family income? What are the perspectives of the circumcisers? We need solutions for this. Right now we are facing a transitional period and in an enlightened generation has grown up everywhere. One of the options is, as I told you, to buy out the girls. Then they get protection until they become adults and at the same time education for their later independent life. So they get gifted time, time for physical integrity and time for education. The government also offers support, sustainable and innovative programs for the circumcisers. I have an example. I personally know the case of a female circumciser who successfully switched her 
profession to produce handicrafts. She is now making jewelry for tourism. I also work with government agencies, for example, when it comes to such work programs. And of course, it is very important to find organizations that also support these goods. It sounds very relieving to me that schools are recognized as places of refuge to protect girls from FGM. Sometimes it's already the case, unfortunately, not always. It sometimes takes even more protection for girls to save them from FGM and early marriages. I'll give you an example again. In Tango Bay in East Pokot, I introduced girls to the Action Reagan program at a girls rescue center. This center was co-financed by, by the Tukutane Ifao, Germany. I taught the girls psychoawareness and everything they needed to know about sexual and reproductive health. Of course, this also includes the consequences of FGM. We talked together about family planning as a life planning. It was a successful cooperation between the two NGOs. The rescue center itself also offered the girls police protection which is unfortunately necessary in some cases. In the course of time, we have succeeded in gaining understanding from the parents for the girls' educational mm -hmm. time. We could achieve that understanding through ongoing reconciliation. This means consulting with the families, especially with the fathers. We had to confirm and reassure them again and again. We are not taking the girls away from you. We are just educating them, let them learn. According to United Nations estimates, the COVID-19 pandemic has exaggerated the situation and slowed down the education processes to end FGM. It is estimated that the sad number of girls at risk of FGM worldwide, 4 million annually, is expected to increase by 2 million more in the coming decade. What has not been possible for you in the fight against FGM since the outbreak of the pandemic? What have you been able to do since last spring and how? Examples such as the initiation rights I mentioned at the beginning from the Korea district unfortunately proved there wasn't. I myself, of course, could not physically go to Kenya until today, which I am very sad about. Last year, I have finished training two new local rain worker trainers, overlapping with the Corona Start and partly online, John Kamala and Francis Mukoya from Kenya. I am very keen to provide strong personal support and guidance to both of them. Since last spring, we have found a good compromise for our communication via WhatsApp, email, or Zoom and I advise them in the diaspora and conduct my supervision this way. Both Joan and Francis are important key persons who will be able to train local rain workers in the future. This is a significant step towards independence and responsibility. The last year was really hard for Joan and Francis. They were able to reassume their outreach work after the first spring lockdown in August at least for a short time until the next lockdown. It was an all and off situation like everywhere else in the world. Now they are active again. Just a month ago, they successfully certified nine new rain workers in Nigori Madeira. I am so proud of their achievement. I bet you are. What are the biggest challenges for the rain workers now and the rain worker trainers due to the pandemic? There is one question that I have been asked over and over again, which is very difficult, psychologically and emotionally. How can we continue the fight against FGM despite recurring restrictions on movement and curfews? We can't always go to the bushland and other areas. I have then always replied to them that they should continue their work in the local areas. Certain routes have always been allowed, going to post office or to the market place, for example. I have encouraged them to use these opportunities for enlightenment and to always take care of themselves. I am motivating them to spread the Action Reagan program within the limits of what is allowed. I tell them, 
knowledge starts with you. So unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our talk, and I really regret that. I could listen to your experiences and plans for such a much longer time. I love your quote, lionesses are survivors and not fighters. I really feel it. We women are silent fighters. We are the con cornerstones of the family daily faced with challenge of education, children, jobs, and survival strategies, which we in turn pass on to our children, our descendants. So when you educate a girl, and of course a boy, you educate the whole family at the same time. This is how old patterns are replaced by new ones. It can only go forward. Now, the future is here. Action Reagan says, plan your future now, then you can have a better and happy family life later. The children are the future. All positive changes that happen now will improve their lives in the future when they will be the ones shaping the world. Dear Margaret, I thank you so much for sharing your deep thoughts, your experiences and your time with us. I wish you much strength and success in your efforts to help end FGM and you're able to reach zero FGM. I thank you also for this chance to be able to share my future vision on FGM elimination in the whole world.